Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. In October 2018, the MacArthur Memorial hosted a World War I symposium that focused on the year 1918. William Walker presented a lecture entitled, The Persistence of the Myth of Montfalcon. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, pleased to be here today. I'm going to zero in on the action uh, to take Montfalcon that involved two divisions and two corps. I couldn't resist this photograph. Soldiers of the 79th Division, and that's what my talk focuses on, saw this broken monument near Esne as they marched into battle. But it actually has nothing to do, it's not the myth I'm talking about. The myth that I'm talking about involves this building. It was a manor house on top of a boot, and inside it there's a concrete structure within that building. Inside the concrete structure was a huge periscope with a telescope on top. And the Crown Prince of Germany had it built uh, to direct the Battle of Verdun in 1916. From that hilltop, he could direct the artillery um, on Verdun and its forts. And they did a very good job. You know, the German artillery was terrific. Now, that's the reason that the Butte of Montfaucon was so important. It was essentially in the middle of the battle. Here are the nine divisions that are attacking, and Montfaucon was right here. It could direct the German artillery onto any of those divisions that would be attacking. Unlike today, you know, I think military doctrine is to go around the hard spots and, uh, and, and strangle them. Um, they had to take that. They had to take that hill because it could continue to kill a lot of Americans. And by the way, just a, 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 a statistic for you to keep in mind, the, uh, anywhere between 65 and 70 percent of the, um, of the deaths in World War I, the battlefield deaths, were caused by artillery, not by machine guns, not by rifle fire, but by artillery. So Montfaucon was so important that Pershing called on it to be to fall on the first day, preferably on the first morning of the first day. And it was such an important um, object that he assigned two divisions to attack it. The 79th here was a National Army unit. Many of the people who were in that division had only been in the Army six months. Uh, they were half trained. They only received half of their training, combat training in France, and they were just unprepared. But Pershing's planners had a great, a great plan. Um, what, what the 79th would do would, would perform a, a holding attack below the hill, and then the veteran 4th Division would encircle the hill from behind. And the key part was this was a very difficult sector in front. The 4th Division had a very easy sector to go through. So they could dash ahead and encircle the butte from behind, and the Germans would uh, leave the hill or be captured. So that was the plan. Now, there are several flies in the ointment. The first fly is you'll notice that these are of two different corps, the two divisions. The 79th was led by Corps Commander George Cameron. The 4th Division, on the other hand, was led by Robert Bullard. And he is my uh, villain, by the way. I'll tip my hand immediately. Interestingly, when the battle started on the fateful day, things worked out about the way Pershing expected them to. The 79th had a hard time approaching Montfaucon, took them most of the day, but they performed their role of holding the Germans. The 4th Division, on the other hand, had 
had very little trouble. One historian described their attack as a, as a dangerous hike. And they were getting artillery, and of course there, was, there were spots along that they had to fight. The problem happened, however, and I'll go ahead and tip my hand here. The 4th Division, the, the Corps that it belonged to, Robert Bullard's Corps, rewrote the orders from General Headquarters so that they would not attack Monfacon from the side and from behind, and that they would keep on going. And actually, the 4th Division was one of the more successful divisions on the first day of the battle. And that's exactly what Mr. Bullard, General Bullard wanted. Now, let's go on from that. What happened? The myth that I want to speak of today is the myth that the 79th failed. Early in the battle, the first day, General Pershing sent out a message that said the 79th Division is holding up the whole First Army. Now, that's a pretty amazing statement. And it, it uh, spurred the 79th on, but it also left a very, very dark cloud over the 79th. As a result of that statement, and I think other things as well, the 79th was exiled to a quiet sector, uh, the Corps commander was fired. Uh, a major general was reduced to rank of a colonel and sent home. A significant, significant move. And there was even talk that they would disband that division because no one would want to serve in it after this. So that began the myth of the failure of the 79th. And that myth lasted nearly 100 years and I want to tell you how it was unraveled. I, was, um, I worked at Gettysburg College for about seven years, and I wanted to go to France. I'd, I'd been long interested in World War I. I had an uncle who was killed on the Somme River uh, serving with the 30th U.S. Division. And so I was looking for, in some old books, uh, for maps of where this might have occurred. And I came across a copy of uh, General Harbord's book uh, about um, the AEF. And as I was going through the book, there was marginalia that had been handwritten by a major in the 79th Division. And he took great exception to much of what was being said. And finally, he had reached a peak of anger. And he wrote, if you want to know what really happened, go to page 638. Well, on 638, I found what, what amounted to an affidavit. This man uh, who wrote it, Harry Parkin, uh, was a classmate of Franklin Roosevelt's at Harvard. And he had taken a year of law school at Harvard. And so he knew the basics of the legal profession. He wrote a, an affidavit in which he charged that General Bullard had failed to render assistance to the 79th. And the, the rumors were circulating at this time. He heard it much later. But what he said, and this is the astounding part to me, this man's a, a man of substance, uh, a very wealthy man, a man who moved to the West Coast and made a, made a killing in real estate in Los Angeles after the war, a very substantial man. And at the end of this affidavit, he says, Bullard received all the high military decorations of France and UK and Belgium and America. What he deserved was a term in military prison for killing hundreds of U.S. troops. Well, I have talked to a lot of old soldiers in my life. It's something that I've done forever. And I knew better than to believe this, but I decided to look into it. It took me a little while. I even lost uh, sight of the book for a while and finally went back and got Xeroxes of it. Then I began to go down and visit with friends like uh, Mitch Jockelson, Ed Lingle, and I began to look around for things. And luckily, luckily, one of my first stops uh, was down in Washington. And the first thing you want to look at, of course, are the orders. Now, the first Army orders say that the Third Corps 
and the 4th Division on its left, will turn Monfacon and the section of the hostile second position within the zone of action of the V Corps. In other words, it's the, the 3rd Corps is being ordered to g cross the border into the area of V Corps, which was the next door division, uh, next door corps, and therefore capture positions west of Monfacon. The only way to do that, if you think about it, it's so well written, is to envelop Monfacon from the rear. Then I went in the National Archives and looked up what had happened uh, to that order that 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 order had been sent down to the Third Corps, Bullard's Corps, and then Bullard's Corps would write the divisional orders. And the Fourth Division, in an order which Bullard had written, says we're going to push its attack vigorously, and it will assist the division, if necessary, assist the division on its left, not by advance into the area of the but by vigorously moving to the front. He purposely negated the order that had been given to him by the First, the first Army. So you, you, do you see that? you understand that? It, it totally negates what Pershing was hoping to do. And I, when I say Pershing, I mean the staff of the First Army, of course. So I thought, well, now that's interesting. Uh, here's a little bit of a of a uh, situation that uh, that really does bear looking into. The next stop was at the Library of Congress. And uh, there I found drafts of, of Pershing's memoirs. The first draft of the art of the chapter on the Moose Argonne was written by none other than Dwight Eisenhower, Major Dwight Eisenhower. And as usual, Major Eisenhower was quite straightforward. And he looked at this and wrote what's on the left. The left of the, div left of the 40, 14th, or excuse me, the 4th Division passed beyond the line of Monfacon. And they did that by about uh, 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon on its eastern flank, but failed to turn or capture the position. And uh, Monfacon hung on. And the important thing about the fact that it hung on is that the Germans were then able to move in more reinforcements because it still stood. Now, here's the interesting thing about this, uh, this draft. And this is the great thing about uh, archive operations like the one that Mitch ran, uh, the one in the, in the Library of Congress. You see the changes that the nominal author who was Pershing here made to the things that were written for him. And as you can see here, he struck out the entire paragraph. And you can see it in his handwriting. Uh, he struck it out in ink and substituted the lines, two lines down at the bottom in his own hand, by the way. The advance on the first day was rapid. The opposition was taken by surprise. I knew when I ran across this that I had a story because clearly um, Pershing is, if not covering up the incident, he is trying to get people to forget it. Now, luckily, there were, there were people who knew what the truth was and were willing to put themselves on the line to correct the record. General Ewing Booth, a man who had come up through the ranks, he was a Mustang, never went to West Point. He knew what had happened. He knew, and it was very common knowledge that Bullard had caused that order to be rewritten. And the people in the 4th Division resented that because they felt that they might be blamed for leave, leaving the 79th alone to assault Monfacon. He began shortly after the war a campaign to gather evidence from his fellow officers. And over the course of the next 20 years, he, uh, got, he asked his peers to write him uh, letters about their recollections. And the file is still in the National Archive um, in, in 
that that Mitch, uh, of course, ran. The file is incredible. Now, it, it's, it's sort of a mess. You have to spend a lot of time going through it. But what you find is a story of disobedience to orders and refusal to help a division that was in tough straits on the left side. You can see um, Booth was warned. He, everybody, of course, wanted to advance his career. Booth was warned, hey, don't pursue this. If you pursue this, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get uh, run over by General Pershing and other people who want to protect this story. And he said, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to pursue this story. And he said, I don't want to be cussed out like those of us have seen mistakes in the Civil War that our, that our relatives now cuss us out. And this man, at his own risk, pursued that story and assembled this file. And uh, it makes you wonder, uh, how, did, how did such a mindset get in, in, involved in um, covering up the story? Let me backtrack just a second and tell you about that. Um, the letters in Booth files demonstrate that Bullard had original orders rewritten to eliminate the term. Later in the day, General Booth, who was in the 4th Division, knew that the 79th was in trouble. It, uh, he suggested that the, his brigade, he was a brigade commander, that his brigade uh, envelop the rear of Montfaucon and Bullard, or his chief of staff, turned that request down. They left the 79th to fight up Monfacon, this butte, and many, many people were killed. It's my supposition that Bullard wanted to capture the glory of the day by making sure that his corps went farther than any other corps, and it did. It was the, by far the most successful corps. As a result of doing so, he was promoted to lieutenant general and got command, as Mitch said, of the Second Army. Um, in 1948, Booth deposited his file with U.S. Army records who, that were later transferred to the National Archives. Now, how did this come about? I want to go back just slightly to the Spanish-American War. Pershing was in, in Cuba. One of his junior officers was complaining about a fat old general who didn't know what he was doing, General Shafter. And Pershing um, replied to him very harshly. And he said, listen, that fat old general you're talking about is going to win this campaign. And when he wins this campaign, the, um, the uh, incidents like you're talking about will be forgotten. Now, I take it that this is General Pershing's statement about how you handle public affairs. Concentrate on the objective and all the incidents that caused problems along the way will be taken care of. This, by the way, I, I came across this picture and I had to use it. Um, it's a picture of Teddy Roosevelt with uh, General Pershing right beside him leading the black troops that, that Mitch told you about. So uh, sort of an interesting thing. Now, Pershing hired, when he became head of the AEF, hired this man to be his public affairs officer. His name is Frederick Palmer. The man was uh, a prolific writer and had been on every battlefront in, the, in wars leading up to World War I. And I recently found something that he wrote after the war. And it says, we must win the war, and war requires deceptions of self and others. I was held to my part by my own illusion, as others were held to their parts by their illusion. There was inter-allied lying as well as anti-enemy lying. Lying became a fine art. And what I was lucky enough to find is that uh, Frederick Palmer provided two descriptions of uh, the attack on Monfacon. On the first one, he describes perfectly a turning maneuver 
where the 79th came up, blocked the Germans, and the other division came around the rear to envelop the Butte. Later, in a later book, he revised that uh, to talk about the failure of the 79th. So that's an interesting sort of situation to me. I want to go through some of the elements of the 79th myth and tell you those that I think are accurate and those that are not. First of all, it's said that the 79th was poorly trained and led. That's absolutely true. Uh, one of the brigadier commanders, brigadiers uh, who commanded the, uh, one of the brigades, uh, had a nervous breakdown and, and would not come out of a bunker. He stayed there, and they relieved him halfway through. 79th was, uh, was inexperienced, and that's absolutely true. It had been short-circuited in its combat training. Um, one other claim against it is that the leaders were not aggressive. I, I would give that a yellow light. Uh, I think that there were many of the uh, junior and even senior officers who were quite aggressive. Some were not. Now, there are a bunch of these allegations which I think are absolutely false. The orders were unclear. I do not buy that. Uh, I could go back and discuss the grammar of that particular order and show you why that's said, but I think it's false. No turning maneuver was ordered. And this is what the people who defended Bullard said. I think that's absolutely false. And a turning maneuver, some people have said that a turning maneuver was even against Army doctrine that it couldn't have happened, that nobody would have ordered it. Let me go on to one of those uh, historians, and, and in doing this, I'm taking on a quite significant person. John Eisenhower wrote the book called Ganks. It's, it's still a pretty good history, I think, um, a very brief one. Um, and in that book, he says that the battlefield was so narrow, and there were so many divisions assigned to it, that there could not have been any major maneuvers between divisions. Well, this would have come as a great shock to Pershing's chief of staff, a, an admirable general by the name of Hugh Drum, who said after the war, when he was heading up Leavenworth, had the Third Corps assisted the Fifth Corps by turning Montfaucon, the battle would have been a much more glorious victory for the American Army. I don't know, I can't explain to you why historians have ignored Hugh Drum's assertion, but it is on the record, and people have just not paid any attention to it. The story continues to be about the failure of the 79th. Uh, by the way, part of... Uh, Ed's talk, I think, will be about the movement of the 82nd Division behind German lines in a similar turning maneuver, which uh, really helped save uh, Sergeant York's, or excuse me, the Lost Battalion. So this happened, and they used it later in the, in the thing. Even in a more recent book uh, by a man named Mastriano, and by the way, I should tell you, we're all, we're all brothers here, uh, military historians, and uh, we, we do take shots at either, each other, but it's good-natured, and it's about the, uh, the statements that we've made. And people will take shots at me, and that's okay. But in the book by Mastriano, he said, knowing the risk of such an endeavor, a turning maneuver, General Pershing strictly forbade cross-border operations unless authorized by his headquarters. Well, the First Army orders authorizes a turning maneuver. Use those words. So he specifically authorized it for the 4th Division, excuse me, for the 3rd Corps, which would have assigned it to the left uh, division. Um, and I wonder if Mastriano knew the words of uh, a senior staff officer, G.T. Ward, excuse me, R.T. Ward, who said these lines, the core boundaries and divisional boundaries, were intended to show the Army concept of the maneuver of these units, the directions in which they would go. And they weren't intended to preclude uh, divisions or corps helping themselves.
Now, what are the reasons for the myth? The original reasons, once again, is following up on Pershing's PR uh, orders. His concept is to emphasize the objective rather than the incidents. They wanted to protect the reputation of the AEF and the 4th Division. Uh, this was at a time they were cutting budgets in Congress, was cutting Army budgets, and they didn't want negative stories uh, circulating, which would uh, bring disrepute on the Army leadership. And I believe that Pershing still wanted to protect his friend Bullard, who was his his uh, company commander at West Point. Bullard was company commander for Pershing in his plebe year. Later reasons is this is an extremely difficult story to tell. It's hard to research. It's hard to tell. It's hard to get people interested in. Um, some modern historians want to contextualize everything. That is, put it in a context that diminishes the significance of it, I think. I wanted to say, hey, this is a, this is a quite unusual event, and we want to concentrate on it. Um, obviously, there are those who want to uh, protect the reputations of the 79th and the 4th. And then finally, uh, every military historian can tell you that if you want to sell books, you better concentrate on victory and heroism rather than failure. Luckily, um, and I thought I was going to conclude with that last slide, but uh, luckily um, I, I received some good news. The, the premier uh, military history operation of the U.S. Army uh, recently published an article about, Monf about the, seven, the, the National Army, and they, they cited my work and talked about Bullard's creative inter reinterpretation of the orders from the First Army. And they even upped my estimate of the number of, great, to 3,500. And that will give you, but there's greater significance than that. My thesis and my, my great friend, Ed Lingle, says I'm going a bridge too far with this. My thesis is that the fact that Monfacon held and was able to direct the artillery for that day and a half is what stalled the American army and enabled the Germans to bring reinforcements and stall the Moose Argonne offensive. So I think there's a greater sort of uh, penalty that the army paid than that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.